Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. We start with question number one from Oliver Mundell. Yeah. Mr Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it's providing to angling clubs and the rural, rural economy following recent changes to the regulation of wild salmon fishing. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Karayam. The package of conservation measures introduced earlier this year protects our weakest salmon stocks through the introduction of catch and release in areas where stocks are below their conservation limit. Many angling clubs have expressed concern that the introduction of catch and release would have a negative impact on membership numbers that were already in decline. To help mitigate this potential impact, we made a commitment to provide up to £100,000 of support for angling clubs to promote catch and release as sustainable and responsible practice. The appointment of FishPal as a delivery partner for this two-year programme of support fulfils this commitment. There has been significant interest from angling clubs and around 30 have signed up to date. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Minister for her answer, but let me tell her things are pretty bleak in Dumfriesshire. Uh, the Dumfries Common Good Fishing Report has recently shown that ticket sales in 2016 are down by almost 50%. Fishing hotels normally packed with visitors are sat empty and half netters on the River Nith have been denied the scientific exemption granted to those on the River Annan. I accept the Scottish Government's commitment of £100,000 to the marketing agency FishPal, but what I want to know is what specific direct support is going to be given to angling clubs and what consideration the Scottish Government has given to stepping up programmes targeted at schools such as Fishing for the Future, which currently operates on the River Nith. Cabinet Secretary. Well, FishPal have been appointed as the delivery partner through a grant award. Um, they're well recognised within the sector as already having established skills and expertise in marketing fisheries. And practical support to ensure continued participation was considered by us to be a more productive way forward rather than direct aid to clubs, which would have been extremely difficult to assess on a club-by-club -club basis. John McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask what extent the Scottish Government can take cultural significance of traditional fisheries into account when implementing conservation measures? Cabinet Secretary. Well, part of the consideration for the assessment of any of our rivers already takes into account the various methods used to catch salmon and the likely impact that the activity would have on the conservation status of the river and our special areas of conservation. I need to remind everybody here that this is all about ensuring that salmon continue to be available in the future for future anglers as well as for those who are angling uh, currently. Um, so uh, the heritage uh, or cultural importance of traditional fishing techniques um, is already factored into the decision making. Rhoda Grant. Thank you. Um, Given that the policy is based on statistics that were flawed because some of the locks weren't fished or indeed fished for the whole time that those statistics were gathered, will she revisit that information and work alongside clubs to make sure that the data that the policy is based on is robust? Cabinet Secretary. I'm conscious that there has been a lively debate about the issue of the stats on which the decision making has been made, but I would remind um, Roger Grant and others that uh, there is an annual assessment basically being uh, put in place um, and an assessment of that uh, uh, conservation status for the rivers will be undertaken by Marine Scotland on that rolling basis. So uh, I would expect some of the uh, debates and arguments to bring, begin to work their way out of the system uh, as, we, as we proceed. Question number two, Donald Cameron. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to make ferries serving Argyll and Butte more accessible for disabled people. <coughs> Mr Hamza Youssef. I thank the member uh, for the question. The Scottish Government has established the Ferries Accessibility Fund in line with the commitment that we set out in the Ferries Plan published in December 2012. The second round of applications for the Ferries Accessibility Fund was announced on the 13th of September 2016. In addition, we've recently published a 10-year accessible travel framework for Scotland. Uh, this supports disabled people's rights by removing barriers and improving access to travel and ensure that disabled people are fully involved in the work to improve all aspects of travel across the various modes uh, of travel and transport, including, of course, ferries as well. But the framework has been developed in close engagement with disabled people from across Scotland. 
Donald Cameron. I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer. A few weeks ago, I met with an enabled Scotland group in Danoon for adults with learning disabilities who expressed serious concerns over disabled access. And whilst I strongly welcome any proposals to ensure future ferries are fully accessible for everyone in our communities, what reassurances can the Minister give today to groups like Enable Scotland to help alleviate this problem now rather than down the line? Minister. Well, I appreciate that uh, from, from the member. I'd be more than happy to meet with the member if he wants to, or, or if he wishes to write with me with the specific concerns, more than happy to take them on board. What I would say is what we're doing here and now, uh, we have just announced uh, that accessibility ferries, uh, ferries accessibility fund, that's £500,000 of match funding, so potentially a £1 million pot that can be spent here and now to improve access to ports, harbours and ferries. During my own summer tours, uh, in, in the last few months, I noticed myself that ferries can be much improved for those with accessibility issues. So, more than happy to, to, to meet with the member, to have a discussion with the member about those specific concerns. There are opportunities to do things here and now, and I'm, as I say, I'm open-minded to listening to those concerns. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I was delighted that the Minister for Transport and the Islands came to Arne on the 26th of September to officially launch the new £12.3 million hybrid ferry, the MV Katrina. Can you please tell the Chamber how the greater capacity of this new Port Glasgow built ferry will help more people, disabled and otherwise, uh, goods and services travel between Arran and Argyllshire, boosting both economies? Minister. I was delighted to, to visit Arran just a couple of weeks ago uh, with the member. It would be discourteous of me, of course, to mention the fact that he almost broke the soap machine at Arran Aromatics, almost annihilating the entire industry of the island. Uh, but I'm pleased, of course, uh, that to, to, to have done that visit and to have visited, of course, the MV. Uh, Katrina, it will be, and it is, uh, a great vessel, of course, highlighting the importance uh, of uh, Ferguson's uh, marine uh, engineering and the importance to Scottish commercial shipbuilding. In terms of the wider economy, it's worth saying that, of course, there will be great advantages to the economy, accommodating 150 passengers, 23 cars, a number of HGVs, but also important to say that the environmental impacts of these new hybrid ferries is not something that can be discounted easily. Fantastically energy efficient, helping us to meet those CO2 reduction uh, targets that we have set ourselves. So I'm delighted and I look forward to being back in Arran, I'm sure, in the near future. Question number three, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to address child homelessness. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government has ensured strong legal rights to housing and support for homeless households with children. Separate guidance has been developed in the particular issues faced by children experiencing homelessness. We're also providing funding to local authorities to develop the housing options approach to prevention. This will be further strengthened by the publication of a training toolkit for local authorities and their partners, which will address the prevention of homelessness amongst families with children. Elaine Smith. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that response. But does the Minister accept that homelessness, to borrow uh, a phrase from the Shelter Report, is far from fixed and that 5,000 children in Scotland wakened up this morning without a home of their own, which has a terrible effect on their mental health, wellbeing and attainment? And given that, we will soon debate the Fairer Scotland Action Plan. Will the Minister ensure the Government's approach to homelessness is brought forward as a priority so that the Government's commitments are delivered as soon as possible? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Government is, of course, committed to uh, delivering 50,000 affordable homes during the course of this Parliament, including 35,000 uh, homes for social rent, which I think is really important in, in tackling uh, these situations. Um, I know that uh, Ms Smith has taken a, a very keen interest in this issues in these issues over uh, the last parliament and, and uh, indeed again this one. Uh, I have a determination to make sure uh, that we can provide the very best uh, in terms of uh, temporary accommodation where required um, for families with children. And I'm more than willing to speak with Ms Smith um, if she would like to, uh, to discuss how we can uh, work together to ensure uh, that we can get this absolutely right for homeless people uh, and particularly homeless families with children. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what recent correspondence it has had with the UK Government regarding the impact on Scotland of the expansion of either Heathrow or Gatwick airports. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government has maintained regular contact with the UK Government on matters related to the Airports Commission and in particular our request that Scotland's access to the UK Global Hub Airport is maintained in the lead up to new runway capacity and increased once this is in place. Murdo Fraser. 
Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response? As I'm sure he is aware, we are expecting an announcement in the next uh, few weeks on whether uh, Heathrow or Gatwick uh, are to benefit from a new runway. The Scottish business community is firmly of the view that uh, the Heathrow option is the better one in terms of connectivity to Scotland. Will the Scottish Government join with the Scottish Conservatives, even at this late hour, in calling on the UK Government to go for the Heathrow upgrade? Cabinet Secretary. Can I first of all congratulate Murdo Fraser for speaking in this chamber for the first time since the election, not mention the words independence referendum. <laughs> um, can, I, can I also say that I am... I'm also very pleased to have some clarity about the Conservative position because, of course, Ruth Davidson opposed in 2010 the Heathrow option and now apparently supports it. The Conservative Party has opposed and supported APD and now I'm not too sure what the Conservative Party position is. These are important things for Scotland's air services. The delay in relation to this has been not just weeks, it's been months and it's been years and the delay is caused by the one person, the one body that can take this decision, which is the UK Government. So we have put pressure on them to make sure that whatever decision is taken, and we've also had the discussions with both Heathrow and, G and Gatwick is in Scotland's interest in terms of routes, in terms of facilities and infrastructure. So we'll continue to do that to make sure that Scotland's interests are put to the forefront and of course we'll continue to talk to the UK Government on maintaining and guaranteeing links to Scotland which is the most important thing for Scottish air travellers. Marie Todd. Thank you. Um, links between the regional airports like Inverness and the Hub Airport will be vital to the rural economy. What can the Scottish Government to do to firstly ensure that regional links are there and secondly to push for a decision and end this damaging uncertainty? Cabinet Secretary. Well, once again, we've been absolutely clear that whichever London airport prevails, and we obviously know the recommendation of the Commission, that we need Scotland's airports to benefit from enhanced uh, access, as has been mentioned by the member. And the new Inverness Heathrow service is evidence of what we can help bring about under the existing capacity limitations, and it's entirely reasonable to expect significant further gains. A number of airlines have made this point as well about some of the additional services which could be gained. It's quite clear this decision is long overdue, and it's having a detrimental eff effect on the whole of the UK. Uh, we can see improved services for the regions, uh, as Marie Todd mentions, so I would just suggest the UK government gets on and makes this decision. Question number six, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to require local authorities to carry out additional training for teachers and other school personnel on how to deal with children who have an attachment disorder or are affected by trauma and loss. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, improving health and wellbeing has been identified as one of the key priorities of the National Improvement Framework because we recognise that children need to feel safe and cared for throughout their time in school in order to flourish and to achieve positive learning outcomes. In our recently published delivery plan for excellence and equity in Scottish education, we confirmed our commitment to review of initial teacher education programmes, and we have committed to working towards every professional working with children being trained on attachment, child development and child protection. Alex Cole Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Many members in this chamber will be aware of the very particular needs faced by particularly looked after children, uh, but there are many other children who face challenges in our school. Uh, teachers should therefore be equipped with the, a range of skills in how to manage that behaviour in the classroom. Recently, I have been dealing with a number of constituents whose children have been further traumatised uh, due to the failure of school staff to adapt their approach according to individual child circumstances. One told me that a child how, um, that their children were shouted at despite school staff being made aware of a history of paternal abuse in the household which led to uh, very real anxiety. Uh, when that uh, child brought that up with the school in question, they were told that no child could be treated any differently than any other. Does the Minister not agree that we actually really need to address the way that teachers are trained to handle the very specific needs of children who face attachment disorder, trauma and loss in our schools? Cabinet Secretary. Let me make two points to Mr Cole Hamilton. The first is that um, it is absolutely essential that every child in their circumstances are taken into account in the way in which their education and their well-being is supported by individual schools and members of the teaching profession. And that is the approach driven by the uh, government's agenda, which of course is uh, widely shared and supported by local authorities, of getting it right for every child to make sure that we adapt and take forward an approach which is appropriate to the needs of every young person. 
Uh, the second point is that um, if Mr Cole Hamilton has any particular concerns about the way in which um, individual children have been dealt with, then the appropriate course of action is to raise those directly with the individual schools concerned and also with the education authorities who have the immediate responsibility for the management of individual schools, which is the, um, the position that um, is provided for in statute. I reiterate my view in general that it is essential that we properly equip the teaching profession to provide for the needs of all young people in their care, and that is what the government's priorities in our delivery plan are designed to do. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that often children who have been fostered or adopted have attachment issues which are greater than, than other children. Would he or one of his colleagues uh, commit to meeting with the adoption agencies here in Scotland to discuss what further support they can get from government and from local authorities in regard to these issues when children are at school? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I'm involved in much of that dialogue already and I, I thank Mr Balfour for his question. And I um, would assure him, having engaged, as the First Minister has um, engaged very recently on this question of the uh, the support for looked after children that we need to have an approach that directly addresses the needs the very challenging and complex needs of such children and to ensure that we can provide uh, the best support and the best outcomes possible and um, fostering sustainable and um, consistent fostering and uh, and uh, ultimately adoption um, can be options that can be taken forward there that must be applied very carefully and directly to the needs of individual children. But I assure Mr Balfour of my um, interest in exploring how we can better serve the needs of looked after children in uh, these circumstances and put in place the support that they require to ensure uh, they can fulfil their potential, which is their right to be supported by the state to enable them to do so. Question number seven, Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact leaving the EU and the single market could have on Scotland's red meat exports. Minister Hamza Youssef. Approximately 80% of Scotland's red meat exports are destined for the European Union. Figures from the industry show that the value of beef and lamb exports uh, to, from Scotland to the EU were approximately 73 million. As I say, that's 80% uh, of our red meat exports. However, if Scotland was subject to current tariffs that apply to countries out with the EU, then the same volume of beef and lamb would cost around 50% more for importers to buy our products. Now, in a highly competitive market, the consequences, of course, could be profound, with potentially much reduced sales or indeed lower prices paid to our primary producers through the supply chain, neither of which is desirable and illustrates the importance of maintaining access to our largest export market. Uh, Joe McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. As he's aware, South of Scotland produces a significant amount of Scotch beef and lamb for UK and EU markets, so this potential impact on livelihoods is very worrying. Can he advise how many free trade agreements with countries out with the EU currently include provision for beef and lamb exports, and what might happen should Scotland be forced out of the EU against our will? Minister. To answer her question uh, directly, the current markets that we trade with outside of the EU uh, are five that we have the free trade agreements with in terms of our red meat exports, Switzerland, Norway, Monaco, Hong Kong and, and Canada. Having looked at the, the figures, they equate in terms of our beef sales to a total volume of 4.8%. Uh, in terms of our lamb, 2.5%. Uh, uh, whereas the EU, as I said in my previous answer, equates to 80%. Uh, percent. Even if you look at some of those countries uh, out with the EU, the tariffs can be up to 30% on some red meat exports, so profound uh, consequences uh, indeed. Uh, there's two things we learnt from the Tory party conference this week, of course. One, uh, their dislike or perceived dislike of foreigners, but secondly, uh, of course, they're pushing for a hard, hard Brexit. Uh, not being members of the single market, not having access to the single market will be extremely detrimental to those in the south of Scotland and other regions in this, uh, across Scotland who are looking to export their red meat uh, to the European continent. Neil Findlay. I have no doubt there may be some very uncertain times ahead following Brexit, but does the Minister agree with me that the daily apocalyptic predictions of Joan McAlpine on any issue, some with even the most... Uh, some with even... Some with just the most tenuous links to the EU 
are in danger of turning a very serious matter to what some might call Project Fear on Steroids. Minister. To be accused of making apocalyptic, hyperbolic assertions by Neil Findlay, the man who scares on every issue under the sun, from St John's on health to transport. Uh, frankly, Deputy Presiding Officer is like being accused by Donald Trump of being anti-Muslim. 